Welcome viewers to our program, Let's Talk. Today, I have the honor and privilege of having in studio Dr. Bisham Bimal, a man who wears many hats. Dr. Ji, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for giving you the mantra for giving you the mantra. He is also well versed in various languages and we are discussing those issues as you go along. So first of all, I will ask Dr. Bimal, Bisham, sorry, Bisham Bimal, to do a bit of an introduction about himself, what he has been doing, what he has done, what his qualifications are. He is a, do a medical doctor, by the way. So, yeah, a medical doctor graduated in 2005, then did postgrad in uh, family medicine, and now doing a master's in public health. Because, um, well, that's the car career path that I see myself going into. But um, apart from that, when I was at university, I remember I did Hindi. When I did my family medicine postgrad, I did French. Mm -hmm. And now my master's in public health, I'm doing Dutch. <laughs> but it's a lot of exposed, a lot of languages. Yes. And it's all related to me searching for my identity. Because mm -hmm. I remember when I grew up with my grandparents. Yes, Trinidad English Creole was spoken at home. But it was a traditional uh, Indian Hindu family where the Hindustani was also something that I was exposed to on a daily basis. Um, I could have managed any language to some extent, but... Um, because after going to school, um, started just being educated in English. It was a past that I always aspired towards. And also for the fact that there was always this question in my mind about the Hindi you would encounter in films, the Hindi you would encounter that people from India who came to Trinidad um, after the colonial times would have spoken, and the Hindi I grew up with, or Hindustani as my grandparents used to call it. As you speak here, uh, my mind goes to the point that you have been exposed to many languages, and you say you're looking for your identity. Do you think the language will bring identity to us? And what language are you speaking about here? Is this Bhojpuri? Is it Hindi? Is it a dialect of Hindi? Um, and that's po the point of contention that I would bring up, but most of what I'd say be based on the research I've done. Um, if I were to speak to you in French now, you would... I would understand a word. <laughs> you, you would understand a word, but the fact that somebody is expressing a different language, you mm -hmm. actually see them as a different identity. Right, okay. So languages are a very important point of identity because a lot of what we express comes from emotions and who we are mm -hmm. and our perspectives mm -hmm. and how we were brought up. So um, a lot of times people neglect the fact that language is actually one of the most integral parts of who we are. Very good. Is it is a tool in which we express ourselves and our ideas? So you are saying basically we need, if you want to identify as Indians, whether Trinidadian Indians or Indian Indians, we must have that aspect of an Indian language, whether it's Hindi, Kannada, Telugu, whatever. And it's very important too because when I travel all over the world, um, sometimes I'm, I may not speak in English, I might speak in Hindi or French, um, a lot of people kind of kind of have it difficult to grapple with what my identity is right. because one in an outward perspective phenotypically i look like i'm from india yeah right um when i put posts on facebook because i have two important pages one is the caribbean hindustani page which um deals with a lot of what we're discussing here mm -hmm. as well as our hindi conversation page where we promote the conversational aspect of hindi um a lot of people ask if i'm from Suriname <laughs> because i'm heavy posted in dutch at times so in myself, when I started exploring all those aspects, I realized that indeed languages are a very, very important point of identity. So let's take from a historical context. Our ancestors came, and you made a very important point before the program started, was pre-colonial days. So when they came here, there wasn't partition yet. What impact does that have on our, our language and how we speak our ancestors? And that's a, a very important point you, you brought up, because um, my grandparents never referred to the language they spoke or their first language, as uh, Hindi per se. They would always say Hindustani or Indian. Mm -hmm. um, I also do interviews with a lot of uh, people in their winter years, over 85, who are descendants of indentured laborers. Um, and when you ask them to, you would ask them, okay, so what language is your grandparents, who would have either come on the ship or parents, um, what, what would, would they have spoken? And, and they often, most of the, response, most of the times the response is Hindustani or Indian, not Hindi or not Bhojpuri. Because I remember when I spoke to my grandfather and asked him once, well, what is this Bhojpuri? He himself couldn't understand. So the concept of Indian la language classification after independence was completely different to when they had left India. Most of the indented laborers came from 
East, um, Western Bihar and Eastern Uttar Pradesh. And that's the heartland of what is designated today as the Bhojpuri speaking area of mm. India. Um, you also have to understand India in the context of geographically or a linguistic geographical perspective to understand what language they would have spoken. Um, I remember growing up, my grandparents themselves even referring to the language they speak as a broken or corrupted form of standard Hindi. Mm. Um, but after doing much research, I don't know if you know about Dr. Peggy Mohan. Not really. No. Dr. Peggy Mohan, a Trinidadian who had done the only documented research on the Hindustani variety in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Her thesis or PhD thesis mm. was um, Trinidad Hojpuria Morphological Study, where she documented the morphology of it mm -hmm. to prove that that language spoken by the indentured laborers and later on by maybe our grandparents or great grandparents was actually a completely different language than what is standard Hindi or what is understood today internationally as standard you Hindi. You made an important point that language brings our identity. But language also speaks about political sovereignty. So when you find that the English brought on our Indian ancestors here, our ancestors, they tried to take away language and give them English. And that happened and have all spin to our generation. What is the impact of that and how do you see that as happening? Um, the political directorate wants you to use their language. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we, to just bring it in perspective, I always look at parallel. So if, if we look at uh, India itself, um, the time the British were in India, which would have been Calcutta, they started their mm -hmm. first uh, mm -hmm. capital. And at that time, the, the, the Mughals would have still controlled most parts of northern India. Um, the language or the aristocratic language was Persian, okay. right? The British themselves, even in their colony, were still using Persian as administration language or the language to administrate, mm -hmm. even though their language was English. And after some time, then Hindustani or Hindi, which we know as today, became the language of administration. So it took some time to change. Even in Trinidad and Tobago, English was not really part of the lingua franca of the masses until the 1950s and after that. It had to do with the British education system. Now, my grandparents would have spoken Hindustani, Trinidad, English, Creole, which were two languages. Uh, before them, Indians could have spoken Patwa, which is mm -hmm. a variety of, of French Creole. Um, they could have spoken Hindustani and English. And in some cases, four languages could have been spoken. But if you didn't speak standard English, in other words, if you didn't go through the education system, yeah. um, Speaking more than one language at that point in time would have seen as something backward or right. something that would have been as peasant or mm. the hoi polloi mm. and not of the aristocratic or educated class. It's my understanding that you are vice president of Hindi Nidhi. Yes. So what are kind of um, trust are you making towards establishing the language or the facets of a language in Trinidad and Tobago? Now, I remember growing up because a lot of what I do would be obviously based on my, when I was brought up and what I saw going on around me. I learned Spanish at school, mm. um, up to CXC, and then after that never used it. <laughs> mm. But yet still found myself being a person of East Indian origin, um, being encountered with the Hindi, Hindustani language on a daily basis. Till at some point in my adulthood I realized, but apart from English, the only other language being of East Indian origin that I interact with on a daily basis is Hindi. Mm -hmm. um, so it should come from the East Indian community mm -hmm. to know that point, or at least to appreciate that point, to go further and say, okay, so if you're teaching Spanish and French at school, and we see a colonial relevance for that, um, then we should also look at our history and look at Hindi, because mm -hmm. it is relevant to a major part of the population. Um, the Ministry of Education has started and they created a syllabus to teach Spanish now at primary schools. Um, the Hindi Nidhi took note of that and what we started doing is based on that now developing a syllabus so that they could teach Hindi at a primary school level as well. Um, it's still in, we're still in, in that process. Hopefully by the end of the year we want to at least develop such a syllabus so we could now present it to the Ministry by before September, so now we could see Hindi being introduced at least at a primary school level and then work further from you there. You know, Spanish, you said there's a syllabus for in primary schools. They are pushing Spanish and there's no problem with that. But the thing about it, for someone who learns Spanish, they have no problem. But how we cross that, that threshold where people think that language, Hindi, is for them Indians only? 
or we have not crossed that threshold yet? Do you think we have crossed that and we can go about in a primary school, secondary school, teaching Hindi as a language and don't have that kind of bias against it? Now, what you have to understand is our education system is still a colonial education system. Mm -hmm. And the subliminal messages you get from it is still that element of superiority, inferiority within the context of colonialism. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the major reason why Spanish and French are recognized as languages we should learn because it was languages of the colonial masters. Mm -hmm. um, and so to English of the Right. Europeans. So, I mean, the East Indian community themselves not to blame, but when you also look at culture, our understanding of culture comes from that education system. Mm -hmm. So that... Um, whether it be French Creole culture, whether it be East Indian culture, whether it be Syrian culture, whatever aspect of it still kind of maintain that um, inferiority associated with it. Now, let's look at, just not Hindustani that my grandparents would have spoken, but let's look at Patwa. Patwa, which is a lot of people, just like I would have understood it as a child, to be a broke, Bhojpuri or Hindustani, my grandparents spoke as a broken form of standard Hindi, which is not. Patwa indeed was also seen as a broken form of French. Mm -hmm. But Patwa is not a broken form of French, it's actually a language within its own right. Mm -hmm. So much so that St. Lucia and all the French speaking Caribbean invested in producing books to teach the children that variety of Antillean Creole, which mm -hmm. is French Creole. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very important to kind of cross that barrier. But you see, and this is where identity comes in, and this is where Indian arrival comes in, is that we truly have to appreciate our identity within the context of the national fabric. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have to preach that message so that even to lobby for the education system to change, where we see not only ourselves, but every manner of person that, f that forms Trinidad and Tobago, or the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, as citizens, mm -hmm are valid within their own way of expression and identity. Only when we cross that barrier, then we could reach that point. Because, I mean, looking at it from a Hindi perspective, yes. And a lot of times, I remember when I was a child, my parents didn't really see the need for me to pursue Hindi Indeed, yeah. as a language. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, parents would want their children to pursue something that will give them a job later on, yeah, yeah. Um, and also give them a promising future. Um, language, whether it be French, whether it be Spanish, whether it be Hindi, doesn't give that because a lot of times, and I think we had this in our conversation earlier, if you really look at the East Indian community specifically, we had jumped from farmers to mm. teachers mm. to bankers, now to doctors and lawyers and well, politicians. Mm. But looking at that over four generations is too big a jump up the social ladder to have our mentality still back in the days of colonialism. So that's so that an important itself. point you're making because <laughs> in this day and age of 2018, how we go about celebrating Indian Arrival Day if you want to go back to those things that you were quite so long ago? Exactly. And a lot of times I find now there are a lot of uh, yeah. conversations with respect to Indian Arrival, a lot of conferences take place. But what comes out of it, we really need to really map where we are now and then decide as a group where we want to because we have arrived, yes. We have. Um, establish ourselves economically, politically, whatever you want to call it. Now we have to chart a course from that point into the next 10 years. Hold that thought. We have you in the program Let's Talk with Dr. Visham Bimal. We are speaking about language. He made a very important point in this year of 2018 of Inner Arrival Day. He, say, he said that language gives identity. We'll return again with the discussion in a short while. It's time to get interactive. interactive. Introducing ITV's People Report, the place where you tell us your concerns. Highlight your issues within your community and let us help you. You call our newsroom at 222-0108 or 222-6177 or email us at itvnews1 at gmail.com. You can also connect with us on Facebook, ITV News Trinidad and Tobago. We'll hear your concerns and let your voice be heard. ITV's People Report, where your opinion matters. Welcome back, viewers. We are discussing today the important topic of Indian arrival. In studio with me, Dr. Visham Bimal, a man who wears many hats, academic, research, and many other areas he's involved in. We're discussing the Indian impact in terms of Indian arrival and language. We'll continue our discussions, Dr. G. Um, 
one point we were making, and I mean which, where, where we have to move forward. Um, now, a lot of times we look at the crime. This is a public health perspective from a medical public health perspective. A lot of times we look at crime, we look at the degradation of society and values and what comes up in the newspapers. Um, but we want to promote culture. Say we call it carnival, say we call it chutney soka. Um, what I don't think if anybody had done any research on such things, but the content of the song reflects the behavior of the society, which is... Definitely. Right? <laughs> um, glorifying alcohol, glorifying sex, mm -hmm. glorifying violence. Mm -hmm. And it's not just soca calypso, but it's also chutney. Um, the and chutney ch themes are realistic, exactly. in my opinion. And from my perspective, because I did work with some artists before and I brought the points up, I actually composed lyrics in the language of our forefathers mm -hmm. and the language my grandparents used to speak uh, for artists to sing. More of a poetic style now. And next, or one thing I think that us as East Indian community, we do not appreciate is that a lot of the songs we have, or at least religious or poetic styles from Kabir Das or from Tulsi Das, Mirabai, or from um, Sur Das, these have come from a pivotal point in India where there was a revolution, a revolution against the Mughals, Mughals invasion and bringing um, Islam into India, where the Hindu writers started writing poetry based on their Hindu perspective. So the famous line, Kahatta Kabir Suno Bhai Sadhu, mm -hmm. that is Avadi, and that is from Avad, Avadapur, where Ram mm -hmm. was from. Yeah. Um, and even in the Chutney songs you might probably hear it, a lot of times I find especially, and I think the artists have to blame is that, they would probably take lyrics not knowing what it means, once it has a catchy melody, and mm -hmm. bring it up. Uh, but if you actually listen to the, the, the content of some of them, they actually contribute at least at a subconscious level, to the me mentality of the population. Um, but if we now would utilize the language as a tool to change that, I think is a very important point. But right now, do you think the Chutney songs represent the identity of the Indian? Um, at the end of the day, even though I mentioned the topic of alcohol, of sex, and of violence, those three have existed in civilization mm -hmm. from time immemorial. Wherever you have human beings, they do exist. Mm -hmm. What I find is the negative aspect is that that is the only aspect of society we focus on to highlight. The weirdest thing about it. Exactly. Who takes whole the, wife and who winding down low. They glorify it. Yeah. They yeah. glorify it. Um, As a matter of fact, the Calypso didn't go about in a better theme than the Calypso the yes. Chutney singers. Yes, that, and that, that's true. Now, Calypso started off being in Patwa, mm -hmm. right? And it, 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 it really um, contained the expression of... Um, revolt revolution that the African slaves would have had mm. at that point. Um, if you really look at the context at least, so we're looking at the development of Chutney music, which would have started from the time of Sundar Pupu, right? Um, His lyrics was good. Yeah, it was. Mm. Um, but at the end Most of, of them are. <laughs> at the end of the day, mm. um, a lot of people who did research in it, Chutney was really the answer for the Indian or East Indian form of expression to be accepted in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Because prior to that, it was not heard um, on the national stage. No. The national stage at this point in time, or at least for the, the de decades past, would have been the carnival stage. But even the acceptance was not there because from Chutney, they had to move to Chutney Soka. So Chutney itself was not, still not, uh, not, not organized. They had to attach it to something else. Yeah, they had to attach it to on somewhere. Exactly. So, I mean, it, it was always a struggle in the East Indian community mm. to let their form of expression um, be on the national stage. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we need to stop, look back, and realize But we come from a very um, a, 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 a highly a world-renowned literary tradition in India, mm -hmm. right? Um, starting from the Mahabharata itself, which is in classical Sanskrit, mm -hmm. um, which are used, which these books, the Ram Charitra Manas, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Ramayana, two separate mm -hmm. books, by the way. Mm -hmm. The Ramayana mm -hmm. is in classical Sanskrit, written, mm -hmm. written by, or at least um, composed by Valmiki, whereas mm -hmm. Ram Charitra Manas Tulsi is in Avadi. Mm -hmm. Again, language shift mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to show how society changes. Um, but they are used as great works, especially mm -hmm. at a tertiary level. Mm -hmm. um, and the poems of who I referred to before, um, if you really look at it, 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 it speaks of a point of renaissance in understanding mm -hmm. the, 
the identity of what is Indian at that time when the Mughals had invaded India. And Islam and Hinduism started to mesh to form what was now the Indian identity. Um, and if you really deconstruct these songs and see the experience, it actually comes from a deep place within, looking philosophically as the devotee, as the lover, and God as the beloved, when you mm -hmm. go into Sufism. Mm -hmm. And it's a recurring theme when you talk about it like that. So the same point you want to express about love, this guy loving this girl. I mean, there is a tactful way to do it, but also send a message and not go down to... Uh, Low level. Exactly. Yeah. So the I key think, maintains a certain dignity. I think, love in a certain, yeah. I think and, and we all know, not the grammar of language now, but understand a language and utilizing a language to create that renaissance, or to create that change. And I think the onus now is upon the artist. To, to, to try but to how will these artists get this hint, this big hint, that you need to sing on topics that really make more sense than just, you know, things that are degrading? And, you know, for instance, recently we had a calypso about politicians, about, about the prime minister and so on, and it was a, a cry against it. Now, maybe the way you put it across, or how to put it across. So how do we get these, these chutney singers? Well, now you call them soca chutney, <laughs> or chutney soca. How do you get them to get that idea in their mind? I mean, uh, I remember... Deal with themes that have impact on society positively. I remember that uh, because um, the artist had sung and then um, people were showing examples. But at the end of the day, if someone does something wrong, it doesn't mean you, you have to do it wrong. wrong to make too. a right. I yeah. mean, you could, you could actually now show you are the bigger person. Correct. Um, right above that. And yeah. language is a very important thing. We see it in Parliament a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And we could actually see um, how worst people are, how mm -hmm. dexterous they are mm -hmm. in getting themselves across. You could basically use low degrading words in Parliament and mm. bring yourself down, or even in speaking to the public, or you could actually be tactful and use words in such a way to get that same point across, but still come across yeah. being, yeah. being the bigger person. Yeah. Um, and I think Trinidad and Tobago is not at a level of understanding that from the bottom right up to the top. Now, I want to ask you, as you speak about it, there's something which I'd like to get your opinion on. When our ancestors came, Right? In colleges, when I went to college, it was taught us, and I didn't agree with it, that our ancestors spoke Hindi, basically, Avadhi, Bhojpuri, whatever. And then they started talking English. And then they came up and said, right, you said, Trinidadian English is not a broken English. It's a different language. So if they're mean OED, that is something different. That is not broken English. So what, what was told us that the way we speak is not between the, the, the clash between the Indians and the Trinidadians, rather it's a new language. And many people are against that kind of opinion. I actually believe, for instance, if I, we speak, Gona, where did Na come from? Yeah, that's Hindi. actually a little So what's the Hindi impact upon our Trinidadian language? Um, yeah, uh, so that's a very important point you brought across. Just like I said, Patois is not broken French, our Trinidad mm -hmm. English Creole is not broken English. Mm -hmm. Actually, our Trinidad Creole English uses a patois grammar system mm -hmm. with an English vocabulary on, onto it, right? So, whereas we would say, I, I, I went, past tense, mm -hmm. we add a past tense marker, which is did, and mm -hmm. use the raw verb. So, mm -hmm. I did go, mm -hmm. past tense, I went. I, I go, present tense, does, present tense marker mm -hmm. with the raw verb. I does go. Mm -hmm. And then, future tense marker is go. Mm -hmm. So I go, go. That actually, that construction I just used there to show you that. But even take it from the Trinidadian language, you said I went. In Trinidadian language with the Hindi influence, I did go. Right. So, yeah. I, I did, I, we say I did go, I did go. Right. I did go. Right. Di, the marker. Um, and another one is um, in Hindustani, we say, um, oh yeah. To say you are able to do something, you use the verb um, uh, jana, jana, to know. Mm -hmm. So you say, um, na jane dhoe, mm -hmm. na jane pakawe. I do not know no. how to mm -hmm. cook. But if you translate it idiomatically, I cannot cook. Mm -hmm. um, that actually came from Hindustani because that's how you would express it. Yeah, another example which you will agree that I suppose is we have this phrase, come go. What is come and go? That's direct from Hindi, jana. Yeah. A jana, a yeah. jaye. If it comes from Bhojpuri, it's ave jai. Mm -hmm. Avijai but Hindi is Ajana. Right, same thing. Yeah, but, but yeah. so they did Trinidadi, they, they, they transfer into the Trinidadian language as come go. No, when you hold, you say come go. Right. Come and is then, one and go is the next thing. And thing. then to the Hindustani languages or non Indian languages, they do the repetition. So you ask them, um, um, Tum kaha kaha gay? Mm -hmm. Or kaha kaha gay? Where, where and where did you go? Mm -hmm. But in English, you don't say where and where. No. 
But in Trinidad English, coming from that Hindustani mm -hmm. uh, 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 semantic and, mm -hmm. um, and grammar construction, mm -hmm. I remember growing up, my grandparents saying, so where and where you went? Right. Meaning you had to itemize. They actually, yeah. And another good example is that, for instance, in Hindi, you, trans, you, you, you duplicate the adjective. Like you say, waha bade bade admi. He's a big, big man. Yeah. That's the English. But yeah. it comes from Hindi. So what I'm saying, the point I'm making is, the structures in Trinidad language came from Hindi. But nobody wants to accept that. Right. And I, I say all of them, most of it. Most another of point it. is, well, you know about to in Hindi. To mm -hmm. is yeah. the, the, yeah. Em, the emphatic to. Mm -hmm. It's ta in Bhojpuri. Mm -hmm. So I remember my grandmother say, I'll bring it here, ta. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. ta actually came, came into from, the speech yeah, 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 yeah. of Hindustan. Or at least the, 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 the East Indians in Trinidad, mm -hmm. based on what they would have heard. Um, one, it might, so, it might sound funny to some people, but I mm -hmm. remember my um, Aja's sister, we call her Pua. Mm -hmm. um, I remember once we were talking about crime. Now, she didn't go, maybe probably just went to primary school and that was it. So mm -hmm. that the language she would have spoken at the DDB was to not English school. Um, so I remember we were talking about the crime and I remember she said, boy, yeah, easy now. Them thief and them shooting the car, K wheel and thing. When mm -hmm. you deconstruct K that yeah. sentence, <laughs> you yeah. realize it's just elements of Hindustan. Yeah. E, yeah. e is yeah. yaha. From yeah, Hindi, yeah, e yeah. and u. Mm -hmm. E is he, she, it. Mm -hmm. U is he, she, it. Mm -hmm. Proximate versus distal. Um, so she used that e, and then she used the possessive mm -hmm. particle, which was the k, ka, k, wheel. Mm -hmm. And I remember growing up with my grandparents speaking like mm -hmm. that. So in truth and in fact, when you look at that generation of the East Indian community, you realize that they actually speak in that point of where I have meshed now of the English and the but Hindustani. But do you, in your experience, actually see in the academic field in Toronto and Tobago, where there is this university, primary, secondary schools, where they actually expose you and tell you that the grammar in Trinidadian language comes from Hindi? No, and that, Bhojpuri? that goes back to uh, the point we were making about the education system. Mm -hmm. Because we still maintain that educational system of a British education system mm -hmm. where, okay, if you don't see it in the Queen's English, then you're not educated or it doesn't sound educated. So mm -hmm. I think that is what is maintained. Now, I remember once, because I have a lot of links from Suriname as well as um, Holland, um, my friends from Holland had come to Trinidad and we sat down with this Trinidadian guy. He's mixed. And he lives in Florida. As a, well, from a child, he went to the States. So we just started up a conversation about, yeah, um, my parents used to tell me not to speak like that. And he started to talk about how Trinidadian people mm -hmm. speak and how they bring down themselves. So me mm -hmm. and my friend, because one of the guys I liaise with is Motilal Marhe. I mentioned Peggy Mohan. Motilal Marhe did the Suriname mm -hmm. research in Suriname and the Hindustani and his son. And we were there with him. And we were trying to explain to him, no, but you have to understand, you have to be proud of that as well. So... Again, it comes back to the point of identity. Today we're in discussion with Dr. Vimal, Dr. Visham Vimal, a man versed in linguistics, and we have discussed, first of all, language gives your direction in terms of who you are and your culture, and we are ending up discussion today with the fact that in this month of Indian arrival day we are celebrating, the way we speak the Trinidadian language, you rightly mentioned, is that Trinidadian language is not broken English. The Trinidadian language has been influenced highly by the Indian languages, Bhojpuri and Hindi. And we hope that this continues. I hope this can be put in a book sometime and expose all of, all of us to that kind of information. So once again, Doctor, thanks a lot. Until next time, viewers, see you around.